Good morning and welcome to the New Testament Church of God in Handsworth, Birmingham, England. My name is Taisha and I greet you on behalf of the leadership in our church. Today, my prayer is that you will receive what God has for you to receive, that whether it's through the word, through the worship, or even through the scripture that you will actually take on what God has for you for this week. My prayer is that the word will also enable you to walk in power and authority through this week that you have, but then also next week that you come and you will be revived and ready for another time of worship. So that being said, let's go into a time of worship together. God bless you. Sing with me. Sing with me how great is our 
take this opportunity to greet you all our virtual viewers in the mighty name of Jesus Christ I want you to join me as we agree in prayer God of glory God of wonder God of beauty God what a friend we have in you eternal father we just thank you for an opportunity where we are able to come before thy presence another time oh father Lord we do not take our life for granted but we thank you that we have the certainty that our life is firmly fixed and rooted in your hands almighty God we just come this morning we know that many are bereaved and many have been sick many are mourning the loss of loved ones there are so many issues round about us Lord Father society we're trying to hold the reign of law and order and I pray father for the peace of the city almighty God that you will Lord sweep through Lord the world with your presence mighty God father Lord we pray that as we are here another time we pray that you will help us as we're about to hear your word father as we're about to participate Lord every single viewer who's watching this I pray, God, that you will let your Holy Spirit be upon them. Mighty God, we're in a, at the point now where all our churches, they're taking their risk assessments. They're all making their plans. Some are starting. Some may be more ahead than others. But, Father, we know that where two or three are gathered, touching anything concerning your word, we know that your presence is everywhere. So, Father, we pray that every church everywhere all of us as we unite our hearts we unite to the glory of you father we just worship you and we pray for the furtherance of this service that everything said and done will be a blessing to everybody anywhere everywhere lord we thank and praise you in the name of jesus christ our lord amen Good morning church. This morning's scripture will be taken from St John 12 verses 23 to 33. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it 
until life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall be also my servant. If any man serve me, he will my father honour. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name, and then came a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I will be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Please say amen to the reading of God's word. At this moment in time, we are going to carry out our worshipping giving. And on behalf of the leadership team here in this church, we want to say a massive thank you to all of you for your generous donations. And we just ask that you please keep them coming in. We don't take it for granted at all, but we really, really do need it. And we just thank you for them. You know, when we talk about um, um, our worshipping giving, you know, Paul, the apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he, he's given us a few pointers. Those who follow Jesus should excel in the grace of giving. And also, giving is an expression of the love one has for Jesus. God loves a willing and cheerful giver, and it's not always about the amount that we give, but it's the fact that we give it willingly. So, you know, our giving should be a natural response for our love for the Lord, for what he has done for us. Please join me in prayer. Eternal Father, God, we just love you, we just worship you, and we thank you for another opportunity where we can give to you. Father, you have given us strength. You have given us health. You've given us a purpose to live. And Father, we just want to give it all back to thee. Lord, our substance. Lord, you've given us jobs. Lord, you've given us houses that we had not built. Father, we pray for your people. Lord, those who have given, I thank you for them. Oh, Father, as we all work together as Lord, Nehemiah built that wall. We pray, Father, that we will continue to work together for the building up of your kingdom. Thank you, God. And please receive our offering in the name of Jesus. Amen. i 
Now we're going to have the word by Bishop Dr. Leon Hales. I pray that you will receive it, as I said before, but I also hope that you have your pen, your paper, and your Bible. Let's go. To the persons who are viewing this online, I want to greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Looking towards the future of his crucifixion, Jesus brought that future nearer when he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This reference is in John 12, 31 to 32. My topic to you today is the cross of the Redeemer. Looking at the cruelty of the cross in its application and accomplishment. Crucifixion was a means of punishment as adopted by the Greeks and Romans from the Phoenicians, Persians, and the Carthaginians. From the time of the Punic Wars in 510 to 264 BC, the Romans employed the cross as the chief instrument of punishment for rebels, slaves, and the lowest class of people. Josephus, the Jewish historian, he informs us that at the time of the siege in Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Roman soldiers, through hatred of crucified 
so many Jews who escaped from the city that there was not enough room for the crosses nor enough crosses for the bodies. Crucifixion was not meant to be a method of straightforward execution. It was meant to be death by torture. This was so cruel and barbaric that the Romans had it in law that no citizen of Rome should be put to death by way of the cross. It is obvious, without doubt, that this torture of the cross was devised by the devil himself at the place of execution. It is believed that the upright poles were driven into the ground. The condemned man was first scourged and then forced to carry the cross to the place of execution. Not the entire cross, but the cross beams. Upon arrival at the place of execution, he was stripped of his clothes and his hands were nailed to the cross beam. His body was supported on the pole by a block and his legs were lashed in an unnatural position and his feet fixed in an upright position to the stakes on the earth. Nails were then driven into the instep of the person, supporting the legs was a block and the nails were driven through them to keep the body up. And so began the slow torture to death. Luke, he wrote this down concerning Jesus. He said, and when they had come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. <clears throat> now, of all the people in the world, what is Jesus doing on the cross? The Son of God, perfect in his being, in his ways and everything about him. What is he doing there? His death in this manner was central to his mission on earth because from the day of his birth throughout his life, the cross cast his dark shadow over him with its cruelty. At one of his trials, he said to Pontius Pilate, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should be a witness unto the truth. The Greek word for truth is aletheia, which speaks of unveiled reality. The Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary was the unveiled reality of God's love and human depravity. He also 
unveiled the masquerade and the lies of the powers of darkness. In St. John's 8 and verse 44, Jesus calls him a liar who abode not in the truth. G.A. Butterick, the theologian, made the following notable comment about Calvary. He said, and I will quote the words, there are places of horror that no man with a shred of dignity would stand. Nevertheless, every man need to stand at the cross of Jesus Christ. Why is this so? Why was it? It is because nowhere else depict such damnable indictment of human wickedness are vividly displayed God's love so dramatically portrayed as the cross of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah prophesied of this saying, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus, having been flogged and his back was torn to shreds by the lictor's lashes, he was physically exhausted and sore, suffering the excruciating pain of the piercing and hung between heaven and earth. Thirst and exposure and lack of circulation added to the torture of Jesus on the cross. You can imagine how terrible it was gasping for breath, fighting with the pain and the horrors that went with this suffering. Oftentimes, crucified men suffered for long periods of time on the cross before death mercifully released them. I thirst, Jesus said in St. John's 19, 80, 28 to 30. The anguish of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is recorded in the 22nd Psalm, which is generally accepted as one of the messianic psalm written by David many hundreds of years before he was born. According to Charles Spurgeon, he said, this is beyond all others, the psalm of the cross. This psalm, titled the Ajalet Shahar, was written several hundred years before the cross, yet it contains the most amazing, detailed array of prophecy concerning suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. When we hear the lament and feel the anguish 
upon the cross of Christ. Our spirit cries out with Isaac Watts and sing, When I severe the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. In our sufferings and difficulties, we often cry out, why me? It is at that moment when we feel our need for God and his comforting presence in our predicament. We must not be despaired, but remember that Calvary was the day when God could not look on. The Bible says, and about the sixth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Heli, Heli, Lama Sabathani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are times in our human experience when we would like to do certain things for a fellow human being. The compassionate mother would rather to feel the pain of her child's toothache than and see her or him free of it. There are times when we try to shield our children from certain experiences by employing all the human strategies that we know how, but to no avail. That person has got to go through the process alone. I had the cruel experience of sitting in court with a young man and surrounding him was a prosecutor relentless, lying witnesses it was as if the horde of hell stood against him to send him down. Those of us who were there could only quietly pray. God saw him through. Oftentimes, loved ones come and going through their sorrows and griefs and believers believes that no one cares or understand what they are going through. It may be that there are those who are unfeeling and indifferent to the plight. But while we cannot understand the reason why, or the depths and the process, or the duration, we can all rest assured that God, he understands every pain and every sorrow that we go through. God is not indifferent today. He never has been indifferent to the suffering of one single person on the planet Earth. However remote a part of the world that person lives, be it Hollywood or Amazonia, like as a father pitied his children, so the Lord pitied them that fear him, for he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are but dust. Psalms 103 and verse 13. The question now arises 
Was there a day when God could not look on? I am persuaded that such a day existed in the historical past. It was the day when Jesus hung on the cross at Calvary's hill and cried out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? The anguish of Christ in his address to the Father, it carries the connotation and suggest the following. I can understand Peter in his denial. He was a weak man. I can understand Judas when he betrayed me. He was deceived, deluded, and a greedy man. I can understand the rejection of the people. They are fickle and goaded by the authorities. I can understand the plots and the schemes of the leaders. They do not understand the nature of the kingdom of God. I can understand why the prince of darkness inspired this moment because of his hatred for God and because he really believe he can win the day. Father, I can understand all these things, but with you, with whom I dwell from eternity, why, why have you forsaken me? According to the cry, for the very first time in history, there was a separation between Jesus and God the Father. At this junction, he was paying the penalty for our sins. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, Romans 6, 23, shows us this solemn warrior alone treading the winepress of the wrath of God for what we have done. At this point in time, Jesus was pregnant with the redemption of humanity from before the foundation of the world as it was prophesied in Revelation 13.8. He was giving birth to a new humanity. The Father, full of love and compassion, he could not look on to see what sinners and their sins was doing to his son. So he had to turn his back on him and allowed him to go through the process alone. What a God we serve. God could only look on when the job was over. When Jesus cried out and said, it is finished, man's redemption is paid. Luke wrote in his gospel, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thine hand I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. We notice he gave up the ghost. He, it was not taken. His life was not taken from him. He gave it up because he finished the work that he did. In his high priestly prayer in St. John 17, before his passion, Jesus declared the completion of the mission that he came to do. 
but at this point in time, on the heisting being put on the cake of our redemption, it appears that the forces of nature got a hold of when the job was accomplished. The sun withdrew its shining in salutation to Christ, its mighty maker. The three hours that plunged the world into darkness was a salutation to Christ, the mighty maker. The veil of the temple in Jerusalem, which veiled at the holy of holies from the common view of people, was divinely rent from top to bottom, revealing the inner sanctum of the mercy seat where Jesus would take his place as our great high priest. When drops of divine blood finally trickled down the cross and touched the earth, it did quake and rent the rocks when Christ the mighty maker died. Matthew 27, 51. The earth, having been affected, the graves of the dead were affected. When the drops of redemptive blood came down and touched the earth, the earth which have drunk much blood by violence of war, travailing since the day of Abel, suddenly came alive in a very new way, rejoicing that deliverer has come for it to realize its earnest expectation at some time in the future, according to Romans 8, 19 to 23. I recall Professor C. L. Ryan <coughs> has this to say about the nature, the balanced nature of God. God is tough minded enough to transcend the world. And he is tender-hearted enough to live in it. He does not leave us alone in our agonies and struggles. But he gives us strength to wrestle through the victory. He seeks us in the dark places of life and suffers with us, for us, and in our tragic prodigality. The answer to Jesus' cry, why hast thou forsaken me? is answered in Psalms 22 and the verse 3, which says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. One significant theme jump out immediately out of that verse and confront us is the holiness of God. The Hebrew word for holy is kadosh, which means sacred. The Greek word for it is agaios, which means set apart, sanctified, chaste, and pure. The holy Purity of God sets him apart from everything that is defiling. The sacred writer in Habakkuk addressed God in prayer saying, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil 
and thou canst not look upon iniquity. That spells out somewhat of the holy nature of God. Jesus became our substitute. He who knew no sin, he became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God in his holiness cannot have fellowship with man in his sinful state. For this reason, he had to turn his back upon his beloved son, who at this point in time took upon himself the sin of the world. The holiness of God caused Christ to be our sin bearer, to be forsaken, to be alone upon the cross. He has ensured that in his dying hour, the redeemed will have the confidence of the divine presence and the boldness to say like David, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, not because I killed a lion, not because I killed a bear, but because you, God, are with me. <clears throat> because there is a relationship with us, I will fear no evil. It is, it was the miracle of divine grace on that day when David met Goliath in the valley of Hela. The shadow of death cast and hovered over him. Yet he came through more than conquerors because of the Lord's presence. By divine appointment and power, our Lord Jesus Christ, he met Satan in mortal combat on the cross of Calvary, and he defeated him. And according to Colossians 2.15, Jesus disarmed the devil, the principalities and powers, he disarmed them and take all power and authority from him. All along the way, Jesus knew that his death was inevitable and his resurrection was certain. Therefore, he could not be sidetracked from the mission that the Father gave him to do. He said, I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is accomplished. That is Luke 12, 50. Now the pre-incarnate Christ prophetically spoke of his resurrection in Psalm 16, 10. And again directly in Matthew 26, 32, saying that after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. These and several other passages declared the resurrection to us, it was inevitably an accomplished fact in the life of Jesus Christ. Let me conclude in the next few words. Salvation, therefore, does not only have its roots in the death of Jesus Christ, it is also rooted in the resurrection, as the Apostle Peter declared. We are now living in a COVID-19 times in which COVID kills the human body. 
but sin is worse than COVID because it kills, dams, and separates the soul of man from God. For the accomplishment of Christ upon the cross and the empty tomb, God had commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereby he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus is risen and is alive. To repent then is to turn away from sin and idols unto God for forgiveness and restoration. In Jonah 3.10, we see where the people of Nineveh, the Bible said God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do to them, and he did it not. I commend Jesus the Savior unto you, for whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Isaiah 45, 22, God said, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else. If you will have eternal life, you will have no alternative but to come to Jesus by faith, looking to the future. If your hope is not in the promises of Jesus, then your future is bleak. But as long as Jesus is around, there is life for a look at the crucified and risen Savior. This is a time you can give your life to God. If you do not know him, you can just come, bow your heads and your heart by faith and say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Please come into my heart. Save me. Change me that when I walk that lonesome valley, I'll have the assurance of you walking with me, landing me into a land that I had never known before. You are faithful. And just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, I receive you now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, I praise you, I glorify you for your salvation. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I want you to join me as we agree in prayer. Eternal Father and God, we just come before you to say thank you for the word that you have brought to us today. Thank you for the reminder of the importance of the cross of Jesus and the suffering that was born so that we can be free. Father, it is in you we have our liberty and have our being. Father, you have set us free Oh God, you know each one of us. The hairs on our heads numbered and the sand on the beaches is numbered. Every grain of them, you know, because it's your creation. Father, we just give you thanks for those who have accepted the call to the cross. Those who are new to the body of Christ. We thank you that you are not an impartial God. And we know that at the foot of the cross, each and every person stands equal in your sight. 
and we know that you are able to keep those of us who have committed our lives to you. Lord, we pray for every single online viewer, our family, our friends, those who are sick at this time, Lord, those who are anxious, those who feel oppressed, our communities, those who are bereaved at this time, may you grant them your love and your peace. Father, you are the only one who we can depend on at this time. And Father, as the shops and the businesses are opening up, we pray your blessing upon the community and we say thanks in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen. That was a fantastic word from our Bishop, Dr. Leon Hales. I pray that you were blessed by it. I know that I was. And I pray that you will take that word into this week as it comes. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And we would love to hear from you. So in the description box below, there is a link for you to leave feedback. I pray that you have a blessed week and I pray that I will see you again same time next week. God bless.